And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Leah Denbock, I'm hopefully saying that correctly, to our ICR afternoon together. Leah will have a very interesting presentation for us. It's not so much focused on Kundalini per se, but the topic that Leah will be presenting to us, not just verbally, but really more visually through her beautiful photography, will, will tie in incredibly well with what Chuck has just spoken about in his presentation, that really the, the way how one can see whether there is some level of awakening of Kundalini active in us is by compassion, and that is compassion for all of humanity. So Leah will show us some of her amazing photographs that um, she has presented in books and that she has worked on together with uh, National Geographic photographer Joel Sartore. Uh, Leah has traveled, looks like, all over the world. And we're very excited to welcome you to the ICR afternoon, Leah, and we look forward to your presentation. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. My mom used to take me around. Larry, who is a Mohawk Indian, told my dad and I, as I took his photograph across the road from the Hamilton Salvation Army Booth Center. She died now, and ever since she died, I've been on my own. As he told us this, he broke down into tears. When I first came to the city, I was uh, working as a bricklayer but then I got hurt, and I haven't been able to work now in a year and a half. Ever since then, I've been on the street. Mom used to bring me here, and she'd go, this is where you can eat. And I'd say, I don't need a place to eat. I've got money. But she'd, she'd say, someday, son, you might not. So she showed me this place. She showed me the soup shops. She showed me all the places I could get something to eat. And I've never been so desperate since she's been gone in my entire life. I raised my five kids and I don't know what happened. I just ended up here. They grew up and through a veil of tears, Larry went on to tell us that his father died when he was just eight years old. He had just passed away. Mom couldn't handle us and she had a breakdown. I remember looking out the back window, crying, watching her get smaller and smaller. My mother used to keep me under her wing, he said. She apologized. Uh, her dying words were, Larry, I'm sorry I didn't teach you what the world was about. I was kidnapped for six years. Trina not her real name, told my dad and I as I photographed her at the corner of Queen Street East and Victoria Street in Toronto. Yat was on the news, she said. I've been raped and beaten on the streets. I've been stabbed a million times. The cops don't care. The cops will just watch you get beaten. They don't care for us. A lot of poor people get beaten all the time and the cops will just stand there and laugh. At this, Trina began to cry. I'm sorry. It's a touchy subject, she said. I was raped by cops when I was 15. So I know what it's like. They beat you all the time. If you don't have drugs, they think you're no good and take your money. Trina continued. I didn't have parents. I had to raise myself. A lady tried to take me in and get me to go to school, but it was already too late for me. After being raped, beaten, tortured, and given drugs, I didn't have a choice. It's no fun. You know what I mean? Good evening. My name is Leah Denbach, and for the past five years now, I've been working on a mission photographing and recording the stories of people experiencing homelessness, more precisely with my book series, Know What to Call Home, uh, photographs and stories of people experiencing homelessness. 
I'm trying to both humanize this often forgotten segment of our society and just trying to spotlight on the problem of homelessness. However, if there's one message that I really want to drive across in my talk, it's this. If you don't know them, don't judge them. After all, is it wise for us to draw conclusions about these people, especially an important one, when we don't know the facts about them? Of course not, but this is precisely what we're doing with people experiencing homelessness. We don't know the facts about them, we don't know their stories, yet we judge them. We look at them and think that they are lazy, that they have chosen to be on the street, but could we say that Larry is lazy or that Trina chose to be on the street? And who are we to judge these people? It is important for us to see that these myths about people experiencing homelessness only serve to stigmatize a group that has already been marginalized. We must always work hard to see that these are only myths. And I believe that people like Larry and Trina need not our judgment, but our compassion. At this point, I want to show you a five minute music video that I think powerfully destroys these myths about people experiencing homelessness, that they've chosen to be on the street, or that they are lazy. This music video shows 70 of my photographs, and it is set to music to the song, Who Cares, which is written by Fred Foster Jr. of Germany. The song is, the guitarist is uh, Gene Black, who played for Joe Cocker, and it is written by Mary, App uh, sorry, yeah, Mary Applegate, who co-wrote The Power of Love, one of Celine Dion's biggest hits. Some of you might be familiar with some of those artists. I'll show you the song. Just let me know if uh, the audio doesn't work or anything. Make a 
Throughout the rest of my talk uh, this afternoon, you will notice that I frequently make mention of my father, Tim. And that is because my project is really a partnership between the two of us. My father will accompany me when I am photographing people experiencing homelessness. He will interview the individual while I take their photograph uh, by asking them some questions. And then we will work together on putting the photos and the stories in the books. I was also empowered to begin doing my project because of the story of my mother, Sarah. My mother was homeless herself. Uh, when she was a child, she was abandoned on the streets of Calcutta, India and rescued by a police officer who brought her to Mother Teresa's orphanage uh, in Calcutta, India, where she was raised by Mother Teresa until she turned about five years old when she was adopted to Canada. Uh, and my mother always kept in contact with Mother Teresa, went back to visit with her. And of course, if Mother Teresa hadn't done the work that she did with the homeless, I wouldn't even be alive. So I think, although it's not directly why I began to photograph people experiencing homelessness, this uh, past and uh, my mother's history has definitely had a big impact on me deciding to photograph people experiencing homelessness. Having photographed hundreds of people experiencing homelessness over the past several years now, I've really come to see firsthand how harmful our negative judgments and stereotypes can have on these individuals. For example, when I was photographing Stephen outside of a bank in Collingwood, one of the bank's managers stormed towards us, as Stephen put it, like a chihuahua. And she had evidently been told that someone had opened alcohol around the facility and just wrongfully accused Stephen because he was homeless. Stephen also told us recently when he was panhandling, someone walked up to him and said, well, you look well fed. Despite being very offended at the gall of the person, Stephen said he bit his tongue. However, indignant as he recounted the incident, Stephen said, I wanted to say, you son of a blank, I could have been 400 pounds yesterday. You don't know. Sadly, I learned that shortly after I took Stephen's photograph, he was beaten up and killed on the street. When my dad and I came across Becky, she was in a very bad way. She was sprawled out on the sidewalk less than a couple meters from a busy city road in Toronto. Since we were very worried about her safety, we had no qualms about walking up and waking her up to ask if she would like to have her photograph taken. She also looked as though she could very badly use the $10 in which we pay all of the people experiencing homelessness who model for me. How, although she didn't say very much, she agreed to have her photograph taken, and most of her responses were of a yes or no variety. However, she did say that she has lived in Toronto for 40 years, before that she lived in Peterborough. She said that she has no family and that she stays in the shelters in the cold weather. However, after I posted the photo of Becky on my Instagram, humanizing the homeless, I received many comments from her friends and family that had been very worried about her and not able to find her. One woman, Amanda, said, I just want to thank you for being so nice to her. I am adopted and Becky is my birth mother. Another woman, Barb, said, Becky was a childhood friend and a wonderful person. This is what happens when mental illness and life beats you down over decades. You are loved, Becky. And this message from Jennifer. Thank you for sharing. Becky is the sister of my longtime friend of 30 years, Jean. Incredible. We never knew what happened to Becky. She disowned her family and left to the big city. Life is too short. I hope she keeps well. And lastly, Nikki. 
I'm a friend of Dave. Dave is the brother of Becky. We've been trying to find her for years. And if you have any information regarding her contact, please, 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 please contact us. Sadly, we learned that just a few weeks after I took Becky's photograph, she was struck and killed by a car on the streets of Toronto. And I ask again, who are we to judge these people? These people like Larry, Trina, Stephen, Becky. And how could we say that they are lazy and that they've chosen to be on the streets? And as I said earlier, if we don't know them, don't judge them. I would now like to give a bit of an update about a story that some of you may be familiar with if you follow my work. Lucy is on the cover of my first book, Nowhere to Call Home, Volume 1. I was standing on the corner of Young and Dundas in Toronto. Throngs of people streamed noisily past, my dad and I. As we spotted this young woman standing a few meters away, she was retrieving something out of the bag. Although the winter had come and gone, it was still quite chilly in the air. We walked up and introduced ourselves. Lucy was dressed in very old and dirty clothes. She looked very lonely and forlorn figure. Excuse me, with a smile and outstretched hand, my dad said, my name is Tim and this is my daughter Leah. Would you be willing to have your photograph taken and ask a few questions? We'll pay you $10. She said, will you take my boyfriend Riley's photo too? When we said yes, she ran north along Young Street and returned about 10 minutes later with her boyfriend Riley in tow. I seated them on the north wall of the Eaton Center because it is illuminated white wall and it serves as a really good backdrop, as you can see from the photograph. And I began to ask her questions. Lucy quickly told us that life has not been easy for her. She began by saying, I've always had big dreams. I've always wanted to be a writer like journaling and short stories and whatnot. But it's hard to keep up with the stuff that you love because now it's survival. Lucy is an opioid addict. I've been an opioid addict since I was 14, she said. But it's always been manageable. I had a job and was going to school. I had interests. However, one day she reached the point where her opioid addiction took over her life. She found herself with no job, no schooling, and no place to call home. Though most of the people or several people that we've met experiencing homelessness told us that they have been able to adapt to sleeping outside, Lucy is not one of them. She told us, I have had a very hard time sleeping outside. Not surprisingly, her eyes closed repeatedly as I tried to talk to her. However, Lucy excitedly told us that she's soon going to be leaving the streets that she hates so much. It's transitional housing, and I'm moving in like three days. So I'll get my own bedroom, my own bathroom, and I'll share a kitchen. Sadly, this was not the case. For a few months later, when my dad and I were again at the Eaton Center, we saw Lucy and Riley sleeping on a broken cardboard box in the middle of the sidewalk. I was doing a photo shoot with another individual, but at one point I saw Lucy wake up and lift her head up. My dad and I were both shocked by her appearance. Although only in her early 20s, Lucy looked as though she was in her 80s. She was in very, very poor health. How is she ever going to make it through the winter, my dad said to me. The following spring, we were back in Toronto looking for Lucy because my book had just come out and she was on the front cover. We wanted to give her a copy. However, we went back to Toronto several times to the same location and we couldn't find her. A question kept creeping itself into our minds. Was Lucy still alive? And then one day <clears throat> when we were in Toronto, we got 
After a futile search for, for her, much to our relief, we ran into Lucy and Riley once again, squeegeeing car windows at the corner of Young and Dundas, where we had found them before. When we gave Lucy a copy of the book, she was jubilant, jumping up and down, yelling, Woohoo! It was very rewarding for me to bring this little bit of happiness to a young woman's life who had seen so much misery. Several months later, the seasons began to change again from summer to fall, and we encountered Lucy once again. We were happily see, it, surprised to see that she was well-dressed. She told us that she had gotten off the street and that she was staying at a women's shelter, that Riley too had somewhere to stay. She even told us that she had gotten her drug problem under control. When, we were, when it was time to say goodbye to her, she turned and said, this is a good thing you two are doing. And in the winter of 2018, my dad and I came across Riley. However, this time he was alone. We could immediately tell from his expression and his face that there was something very wrong. Lucy is in the hospital, he told us. She is not doing well. As he said this, Riley began to cry. When it was time to say goodbye, Riley said, thank you so much for putting Lucy on the cover of your book. It made her feel human. In April 2019, a producer with a major media outlet expressed interest in doing a story about the positive impact that the photograph and the cover image had upon Lucy's life. However, first we had to find her. We spent months looking for her without any luck. And a question kept creeping into our minds, was she still alive? Did she ever recover? We got a lucky break one day. We were doing a photo shoot with a woman named Diamond outside of a safe injection center in Toronto. And she told us that she was friends with Lucy and would pass on the information. The very next day on the answering machine, there was a message from Lucy telling us that she was doing much better and that she wanted us to call us back, to call her back. She told us that her and Riley were sharing an apartment together and that they had gotten off the streets and that they were doing much better. She also told us that she got her drug problem under control and that she had even began writing again. When we told her about the possible news story, she was positively ecstatic. Later that day, my dad received an email from Riley, and it said, I can't begin to thank you enough, partly because your book exists, and you chose to put Lucy on the cover, are the reasons that we are alive today. When you took Lucy's photograph, we had both given up on life, but now we have chosen to live. We no longer smoke crack cocaine, which was very difficult to say the least. Lucy is now a healthy weight and happier than I've seen her in a long time. And I know that I am. We are both on our way and being healthy in both mind, body, and soul. This is a photo of them recently after they've recovered and gotten off the street. Albert Schweitzer, a theologian, physician, and humanitarian once said, I have always held firmly to the thought that each one of us can bring some portion of misery to an end. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think that it is really in our hands to help these people. And I'm going to suggest to you three things that we can all do to help people experiencing homelessness. Firstly, we can treat people experiencing homelessness with respect. For To quote Mother Teresa, we have the wrong idea that the only hunger is a hunger for bread. There is a much greater hunger and a much stronger hunger, the hunger for love, the hunger to be somebody to somebody. That is a much greater hunger and a much greater poverty. 
the feeling of being unloved, rejected and unwanted, that is a very great hunger. A couple of years ago, I was doing a photo shoot with a woman named Catherine in Toronto. After the photo shoot, she grabbed my dad's hands and both of hers and she said, thank you so much for doing this. Most people just ignore me. And more recently, when I was doing a photo shoot in Hamilton, I showed my books to a staff member at the Booth Center and he said, days will go by where no one will look at these people. No one will talk to these people. But you look at them, you talk to them and you are giving them dignity. This is something that we can all do. Next time you see a person experiencing homelessness, crouch down to their level, look into their eyes and say, hello, how are you doing today? Shake their hands. I think you'd be really surprised how much these little gestures are appreciated and will make a huge difference in their lives. Secondly, we can financially support organizations that help people experiencing homelessness. These organizations have the know-how and the resources to best help these people, and they're often cash-strapped and could really use our financial support or volunteers. Incidentally, I donate 100% of both my books and exhibits back to homeless shelters, and if you're interested in supporting some of these organizations, I have lists of the organizations that I know and trust at the back of my books. Um, hopefully I can like share a link or something like that to my website so that you guys can get my books uh, if you would like to. And thirdly, we can pressure the government, both nationally and provincially, to build more affordable housing. David Giffen, the executive director of the Coalition of the Homeless in New York City says, the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are simply there because of lack of affordable housing. It is exceedingly rare for these people, if they have to choose to be on the street unless they have no other rational options. In nearly 30 years of my involvement with people experiencing homelessness, I have yet to meet anyone who would choose to turn their back on an affordable place to live. We must always work hard to dispel the myth that people are homeless by choice, when in fact no choice exists. In closing, I want to read to you this statement by Nelson Mandela, one of my heroes. It is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. That was a startlingly touching presentation, certainly speaking from my perspective. Um, again, like, like I said earlier, it, it just really links the humanity, the compassion that we all are called to feel. And um, thank you for those beautiful pictures. Um, I, specifically, I really like a term that you said, experiencing homelessness. You know, mm -hmm. it's not something someone chooses that you're experiencing homelessness. I will, I will take that away with me from you. And I, I also find once you tell them that they're homeless, you're really putting them in this box of that's who they are. But really, they're just average people in a phase in their life, and we should help them get out of it. Right. Yeah. And you gave us some very practical input of what we can do as individuals to, to help the situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we finished, we finished early. We have a little bit of time left. Paul, what would you like to do? do you, is there anything else that you have to share with us? Do you have some more photos? We've got probably a good, a good 10 minutes left. Um, there's not, but if, like, if you guys are open to it, we could just do the question time now, and then we don't have to do it later, since we have time for questions. But somebody wanted you, uh, Leah, to... I guess to either send a link to the little video that you showed. Oh, yes, I can do that. Um, yeah, so that was a request that we got. I'm, I'm not sure how you want to send it or 
If um, I send it in the chat, is that okay? Um, well, you'd have to send it. To, have to send it to everyone. We've asked people to send it privately to me, but okay, I'll send it to everyone. Send it to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good. I will also add a link to my website, um, and on my website, you can follow the work that I'm doing. Uh, you can also see all three books that I have: uh, Nowhere to Call Home, Volume One, Two, and Three. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's 40 photos and 40 stories of people experiencing homelessness <laughs> in each book. And uh, like I mentioned earlier as well, I donate 100% of the profits back to homeless shelters. Uh, so it makes a great gift. And uh, you can see where it's available online and in bookstores on my website. And I'll post that here. And it's also a great way to follow me and uh, see the exhibits that I'm having and the talks that I'm having and anything like that. So I'll, I'll add that. Did I... Did you get the link to the video though that I added in the chat? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll add a, the link to the website too. Could I speak? Paul? Yes. I don't have I, I have a, re hang on a second, Chuck, if you don't mind. I just have a request from somebody uh, else who's asking uh, if Leah is familiar with uh, Jesse Thistle. No, I'm not. From the Ashes, author of From the Ashes. Just a suggestion, I guess. It's the name of the book. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely look into that. Okay. So I guess we can take uh, questions from everybody uh, as long as we all don't ask at the same time. Uh, and I know Chuck. Chuck had a question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do have a question, and it's not a question. Aaliyah, I had a chance to, my photographer was Ken Hyman in New York City, and he was Margaret Mead's only photographer and only traveling companion, and he taught me how to deal with people on the street. And I can do what you've done, but I could never do it as beautifully as you've done it. Thank you spectacular and it's uh it's taking my composure away but i want to tell you you are a star and your ride has just begun but you're going to get there because you're being true to what you're called to do and it's beautiful work whatever you do don't give up Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm leaving it to you, Sabine. <laughs> <laughs> well, to ask if anybody has any other questions. Yeah, if, if there are no other questions, it, it's really amazing, Leah, that you also shared a success story with us. I'm, I'm sure there's far and few between. We wish there were more, but the, mm -hmm. the humanity that you, that you bring to the home, people experiencing homelessness is, is really a gift, a gift to them. And I know a lot of us are afraid to do that. So you're, you're very brave to live that compassion and, and we thank you. We thank you for that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So if there are no other questions then maybe we'll break a little bit early and um, we'll reconvene at uh, 245 for the next presentation by Matt. Great. So last chance for questions for Leah. And some, some questions may come, uh, may come later too, and I don't know if you're able to join us for the panel discussion later on. Yeah, I, I heard there's like another question time for all the speakers, is that correct? Yeah, it starts at 415 and we would love to have you join us for that. Okay. Sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leah. It's truly, it's truly been an honor to, to be able to see those pictures from you. Thank you. I really Thank you. It. And we'll see everyone again at uh, 2.45. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all.